Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're very, very welcome to this, our first lecture in the, I think it's the 17th series, the Tipperary People and Places series. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Brian Gurn. I first heard Brian speak, I must have been 20, if not 25 years ago, I think it was in the Burlington, and you spoke to a library group about census and census substitutes. Ago, yeah. And it was an excellent lecture. As was Brian's last lecture, to us here on the death census of 1847. And tonight his topic is the religious census of 1766. So without further ado, I hand the floor over to Brian. Thank you very much, Mary, for the introduction, and uh, you're all very welcome. So I'm going to talk to you about the religious census of Ireland of 1766. It is one of the richest sources available to the historical and genealogical researcher for the period prior to the commencement of the statutory census series in 1813. Although most of the original 1766 religious census returns were destroyed in the destruction of the Public Record Office in 1922, 59 original items from the 1766 census survived the fire. And we look at some of these 59 items this evening. In addition to those 59 items, however, transcripts, extracts, and parish numerical abstracts have survived for a large part of the island. Now, my current job sees me as a census and population specialist on the Virtual Record Treasury of Ireland project, which you may have heard about last year. Uh, it's a Government of Ireland funded project which aims to reconstruct, in a virtual sense, some of the records which were lost in the Public Record Office explosion and fire on the 30th of June 1922 in the earliest manoeuvres of the Irish Civil War. The project has five core partners, the National Archives of Ireland, the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, the National Archives UK, the Irish Manuscripts Commission, and the Library at Trinity College Dublin. And these institutions have provi provided us with resources, funding, advice, support, and expertise, and importantly, access to their various collections. Beyond these five are many partners and supporting institutions too, and we have received wonderful support from upwards of 70 libraries, archives, and institutions around the world. Uh, without their very welcome support, that we've received, our project could not have proceeded in the fashion that it did. And we're most grateful to our partners for their assistance. Now, what was the 1766 Religious Census of Ireland? The 1766 Religious Census originated in a resolution of the Irish House of Lords that I show here. It was issued on the 5th of March, 1766. And it called for the Church of Ireland parish clergy, the Church of Ireland parish clergy, to return directly to the House of Lords a list of the several families or householders in their parishes with the religion of each householder noted. And the ministers were also to list the names of any resident Catholic priests and friars in their parishes. And all of that information was to be returned to the House of Lords by the first Monday after the Easter recess. That's the 5th of May, 1766. Now, that was a very tight time frame, given the time and social circumstances in Ireland in the 1760s. In the short space of 62 days, between the issuing of the resolution and the deadline for the re re receipt of the returns, that's less than nine weeks, the requirement of the Lords had to be communicated from Dublin uh, out to the individual diocesan offices, including the diocesan office for Cashel and Emily, and the clerks in the diocesan offices had to prepare individual letters of instruction for each parish those letters then had to be posted to the individual ministers 
uh, in their parishes. And the censuses then had to be prepared or taken by the parishes. And then they had to be posted back to Henry Baker Stern, the clerk of the House of Lords. And we must remember that name because we're going to meet Henry Baker Stern again in, the few, uh, in, in a couple of slides from now. And all of that had to be achieved within the tight uh, time frame of 62 days. The 1766 religious census was hugely ambitious, but although the Lords sought a list of the names of every householder in every parish throughout Ireland, not all parish ministers complied with the request. Some parishes failed to make any return at all. They ignored it. And other par parishes merely provided numerical estimates of the total number of householders for each religious denomination without providing the list of names. And many of the returns were very basic. And we often have no way of knowing if they were mere casual estimates of the denominational breakdowns or if they were based on actual formal surveys. The return that you see here is the return for the Union of Thurlis, where we are at the moment. It was signed by Reverend Michael Oban, Michael Obans. It's dated the 10th of April, 1766. And this is an example of one of the more unsatisfactory or rudimentary returns. It doesn't provide a list of names as requested by the Lords. It just gives the most basic population information uh, on a denominational basis. 1,103 Popish families or Catholic families and 89 Protestant families. That's 1,192 1, households in total. Now, if we presume that a typical page of names would have held roughly 30 names, Oban's return should have run to about 40 pages listing those 1,200 odd names. But instead, he simply returned this single page. This was his 1766 return. And even James Butler, the Catholic Archbishop of the diocese and a resident in the Union, though noted by Obans, still went unnamed, as did the eight other Catholic clergymen whom he also referred to. Clearly, Obans did not see the merit in fully complying with the instruction from Michael Cox, his Archbishop. However, Many parishes did return the required list of names, and some ministers even exceeded the Lord's requirement by providing additional information, making the 1766 census very attractive to genealogists and historical researchers. And we'll have a look at some of these later. First, though, let's have a think about the geographic coverage achieved by the Lord's call for religious denominational information. As we've noted, the call for a list of parishioners required responses within this very short time frame of 62 days. Detailed reporting on the uh, goings-on within Parliament was not a thing in the mid-1760s. So the first most ministers would have heard about the Lord's requirement was when they received a letter from the diocesan offices, office, likely some days or perhaps a week or so after the parliamentary resolution. And of course, ministers would, may have been detained by other affairs, so they could not necessarily drop everything to, complete the, to compile the desired list of names. Now think for a second about how long it might take to produce a list of householders' names in a parish. Obviously, various factors would have influenced this. In particular, the number of houses in, in, in a minister's parish. Many parishes were small. The minister for Kilrush Parish in County Gildare, for example, can hardly have been taxed too much in his compiling a list of, na of the names of six Protestant and 27 Catholic householders, or 33 names in total. But other parishes were huge, containing upwards of a thousand households, and writing in longhand such long lists of names must have involved extensive investment of time, for which, it should be noted, no financial recompense was forthcoming. This was a civic duty task for the clergymen. However, the exercise, if it was to be correctly conducted, did not simply involve writing a list of names of perhaps many hundreds, but it should really have involved the ministers going out into their parishes 
and calling from house to house to obtain the required information. Ministers should not have been relying on any lists they had to hand, such as tithe or cess lists, because poorer families, predominantly Catholic, would not have been included on those. We, know that some minister, we do know that some ministers conducted fulsome surveys at their parish, but others likely did not. Nonetheless, even sitting down to write the returns for some parishes like Blairis County Antrim, which contained 1,478 households names, or Ahalu and Carn uh, with 1,364 names, or in Cork, the Kilworth Union with 1,216 names, would have taken many hours to compile. Since many of the returns were destroyed, in 1922, the return containing, containing the longest list of names is not known. For Cashel and Emily Diocese, sizable lists were available for Kilnarath Union in West Tipperary with 966 names, Feathered Union in the south of the county with 923 names, and the Union of Toom straddling the Limerick Tipperary border with 767 names. So significant returns from Cashel and Emily as well. Now, a significant discovery during our project, during phase two of our project, was the survival of an enormous 10 volume index to the parliamentary records, which were located in the public record office before it was destroyed in 1922. This index, which has been carefully preserved in the National Archives for the past 100 years, proved immensely valuable to us during our researches. And significantly, beyond recording the location, uh, author, and the date of each return in these columns, the index also notes for each individual census return received whether the original returns contained the required list of names or simply raw denominational numbers. On the screen, you see a part of the page detailing some of the returns for Cashel and Emily. And in the image shown, the green rectangles indicate that returns of names were provided as per the request of, from the House of Lords. And the, so that's those, the green square triangles. And these, this red rounded uh, rectangle is for Cashel and it is just simply a return of numbers. So this in index tells us whether a return of names or a return of numbers was received. And this index covers all the returns that were received, even returns that are destroyed. So we know what was available in the public record office, even if the records have been lost. And the top entry up there is, as you can see, it's a rounded reg red rectangle. So that means it's, a, it's a, a numerical return, not a return of names. That's for Tartarahan Parish in Armagh Diocese, because this is Armagh Diocese concluding, and then Cashel and Emily, the list for Cashel and Emily is the way it's provided in the index. For some places, unfortunately, the, Im the index can be ambiguous, meaning that in a small number of cases, it was not possible to figure out with absolute certainty if parishes had returned names or numbers but these ambigu ambiguous listings were relatively few. Now, using this index, our project was able to produce a map to parish or parochial union level showing the coverage of the 1766 census when the returns were received. And this was the first time that the, recovery, the coverage from the House of Lords call was shown car cartographically. So here is the map. Let me explain it. First, the index lists the returns for all dioceses in the country, except the Diocese of Meath, which I show here in green. It doesn't, it doesn't list the returns for, for Meath. Although the character of some of the returns for, for Meath Diocese are known from alternative sources, nothing is known about most of the 52 or so returns from that diocese. No returns were received from areas shown in white. And you can see that County Kerry and parts of East County Limerick were particularly badly served by, that, by the survey. The parishes shown in dark blue are parishes from where only numerical returns were received. 
Parishes that are shown in light blue are areas where the index is somewhat ambiguous, but we strongly suspect, though we're not fully certain, that these, these locations also return numerical responses. It's important to note that this map remains work in progress and we continue to, in, to investigate the issue to see if we can firm up our knowledge of some of these dubious areas. As you can see, rudimentary numerical responses were received from large areas of the country, including extensive areas across Ulster, North Leinster and Mid Connacht, County Clare, down in the southeast, and this Mid Leinster region. And the block of territory, the large block of territory running from the northern border of Mead Diocese up to Donegal stands out in particular. Although there was a near 100% response rate to the Lord's call to provide information from this extensive area, and that's a remarkable achievement in, in itself and quite unlike uh, other areas such as Kerry and East Limerick where the call seems to have been virtually ignored, most of, most of the returns from this extensive block of territory were simply numerical responses only. Now parishes shown in dark red are areas from which lists of names were returned. And as you can see, it includes most of Cashel and Emily. And the light red, like these, this big block of territory here and these ones here, the light red areas show areas which we believe complied with the list of names requirement. And this is the issue of ambiguity again with the index. And as you can see, we face particular problems with uh, Cork, and I'm sure that I'm not the first person to utter those words in County Tipperary. Now there's a distinct ge geographical slant to the areas which complied with the Lord's specification for the list of names. The most extensive area from which predominantly names responses were received was from a contiguous block running from North Wicklow in the east to the North Kerry border in the west and southwards through Cork to the southern coast. This region includes most of the dioceses of Cashel and Emily which were gathered here to consider this evening. Other notable blocks of territory from which lists of names emerge can be seen in northern Connacht, East Galway and an elongated north-south stretch running from the North Antrim coast through eastern Derry and Tyrone to West County Armagh. It's important to note that, that, that counties counties, the geographic entities with which people typically associate, can be somewhat misleading when viewing the character and content of the 1766 responses. Because earlier we noted that the information was communicated from the House of Lords to the parish ministers via the diocesan network. Because of this, it's the diocesan geographies which are of greater relevance to us than county boundaries as the instructions from individual dioceses regarding the scope of the census may have varied somewhat. It should be remembered that the instructions in the Lord's resolution is unimportant because the ministers would not have seen that. What is important is the instructions which were communicated to them by the diocesan officials, and it may have varied somewhat. This may account, for example, for the fact that most of the parishes in one diocese, Kilala and Econry up here, most of the uh, parishes in one diocese, Kalala and Connery, for example, which covered parts of Sligo and Mayo, returned a list of householders' names, while the area was surrounded by parishes in other dioceses, dioceses which were providing numerical returns only. Even within dioceses, it was often the case that contiguous parishes returned the same type of information. We can see this, for example, in parts of, parts of East Donegal and Tyrone where uh, numeric or name responses were received, and in Fermanagh, around Enniskill and town, and for parts of County Cavan around here. Why might this have occurred? Why might some areas have, it, within dioceses have returned names and others just return, and most of the rest return numbers? Two possible reasons for such concentrations spring immediately to my mind. First, it's possible that different clerks within the, the diocesan office were allocated specific geographical areas within the diocese and were communicating slightly different instructions to their allocated parishes. Or second, and perhaps more likely, following the receipt of the diocesan instructions, some ministers may have communicated with their neighboring colleagues to, 
to agree an appropriate approach to the request. It's important to note, however, that although the diocesan instruction to the individual parishes would be cru crucial, the content on of only one of these instructions, that from the diocesan office of Down and Connor Diocese in the Northeast, is known to survive. As you can see, it was dated on the 6th of March, which was the day following the re passage of the resolution in the Lords, and it provided no instructions other than including a copy of the Lord's resolution, which we saw earlier. The information required by their order, a copy of which I send to you. Down and Connor, at least. Now, we mentioned Henry Baker Stern. The responses to the Lord's requests were, as we noted earlier, to have been returned to the House of Lords by the 5th of May, 1766, specifically to Henry Baker Stern, the Clerk of the House of Lords. After the House issued the instruction, Parliament went into Easter recess, and Baker Stern set off for Bath and Somerset, presumably to enjoy its famous geothermal springs. In a tragic twist, however, he never arrived there, dying en route in mid-April. Thus, the census returns arriving at the House of Lords as the deadline approached were specifically addressed to a man who had already died. The Dublin Courier, of 25th of April, 1766, announced that Baker Stern had died a few days ago. So this return from Clonbeg Parish in the South Tipperary, postmarked, as you can see, 28th of April, postdated his demise. It was posted at a time when Baker Stern was dead. Now, names, numbers are nothing at all. Despite the short time frame, the response to the Lord's call was quite spectacular and, dare I suggest, perhaps even unexpected. Although we have seen some areas defaulted, the geographic coverage, excluding the Diocese of Mead, which we know little about as yet, reached 83% of the remainder of the island. 83% of the ge geographic area of the island, other than the Diocese of Mead, was covered. Although many of the returns were numeric only, it seems doubtful to me that the Lords could have anticipated such an enthusiastic response from the Church of Ireland clergymen. It's worth noting that when the statutory census series commenced in Ireland in 1813, the first uh, statutory census of Ireland, the censuses that we know today in 1813, the geographic coverage from the first statutory census, uh, which was specifically a numbers only census, it didn't require a return of names, it only reached 80%, and that after the passage of 21 months. So the 1766 census covered a far greater land area in a fraction of the time, and this in the mid-18th century. If the 1766 census had been universally conducted along the lines requested by the Lords, returns listing the names of about 600,000 households in total should have been received at the House of Lords. However, since numerical returns predominated, the final outcome fell well short of that total, although I estimate that about 150,000 names were ultimately reported to the Lords in the approximately 850 responses received, and those covering about a third of the, uh, about a third of the geographic area of the island. No survey conducted in Ireland before had attained this scale of, of, of coverage, and uh, the list of names represented the earliest near-universal parish listings available for most areas. In fact, the record set by the 1766 religious census stood for 55 years until it was finally surpassed by the second statutory census of Ireland in 1821, when the names of about 6.8 million inhabitants were recorded. It's for this reason that I believe we can consider the 1766 religious census as Ireland's first census. Although not a census in the uh, conventional sense, sense, and unlike censuses as we understand them today, the hallmarks of this survey, coupled with the extensive coverage achieved, justifies this title in my opinion. What makes it even more interesting is that many ministers, especially outside of Ulster, went well beyond the requirement to provide the list of names distinguished by religion, as the Lords had requested. Some supplied comprehensive details on the makeup of the individual families listed in their returns, 
which could only have been prepared following exhaustive door-to-door -door surveying and querying. An added boon is that some ministers, in addition to providing demographic denomination, denominational information, seize the rare and perhaps unique opportunity to communicate directly with the seat of government by venting about social conditions in their area. Charles Humble, from Kilishal Parish in County Tyrone, for example, complained bitterly about the conduct of his Presbyterian neighbours during the Hearts of Oak disturbances a few years earlier. The spawn of Spottish Covenanters, as he refers to Presbyterians, is literally dripping with venom. Thomas Vesey from Armoy County Antrim spoke kindly about his Catholic counterpart. John White from Boho in County Fermanagh did not share Vesey's sentiments describing his Catholic neighbours as poor, low, illiterate people with low mental capacities. Francis Stephen Thomas from Newchapel Parish in South Tipperary, bordering County Waterford, noted that rumours abounded that his census was, would be followed by the confiscation of Catholic children. And R Richard Lloyd was discontented by the fact that Father Daniel Neal remained officiating as a priest in Callan Union, Union in Tipperary, despite his breaches of the law having resulted in the deaths of many people some years earlier. Important social commentary such as these extracts provide the historian of today with unique insights into interdenominational relationships and social conditions and tensions in mid-18th century Ireland. Now, the 1766 religious census pr proved especially attractive to genealogists for two reasons. In the first instance, the census returns provided lists of providing lists of names represented unique lists of inhabitants of parishes in the 1760s. And second, when the records were made available to researchers in the public record office, the archive charged researchers one shilling to access records which had been compiled after 1820. This meant that the 1821 census, which you mentioned a few moments ago, had to be paid for, but no financial charge was levied if the 1766 census was accessed. And because Ireland's genealogists are a parsimonious enough bunch, it was something of a no-brainer for them to make a regular beeline for the cheaper of the two options. But before we consider the returns of the Public Record Office, let's look briefly at the history of the returns. Baker Stern, as we saw, died during the census, and that may have impacted on the Lord's plans for the returns, which were landing at Parliament during the Easter recess. George Myers, Baker, Turns, Baker Stern's temporary replacement as clerk, was promptly tasked with abstracting the returns, the information in the returns by Parish into a book which became known as the Book of Returns. The entire collection was then arranged into seven bundles organized by diocese, and the first of these bundles, bundle 76, contained the returns for two dioceses, Armagh and Cashel and Embley. The Lords were conscious that their resolution of, 5th, of the 5th of March had produced a unique and expansive survey of the country, but they didn't know what to do with the information. In February 1768, a Lord's Committee was established to inspect the list of Protestant and Popish families returned from the several dioceses of the Kingdom, but nothing more is heard of the Committee, and the returns do not appear to have been exploited by the Lords to any significant degree. When the Parliament closed in 1800, its vast collection of records, which include the 1766 census returns, was transferred in 1802 to an office in Anglesey Street in Dublin, and about 1815, it was, they were moved to the record tower in Dublin Castle. And it was while the returns were located in the castle that the 10-volume index was compiled, which I used to plot the coverage map. The index was the work of one man known by the delightful name of Theobald Richard O'Flaherty. It took him 10 years to complete the task of indexing the returns. And these returns, including the 1766 returns, they stayed in Dublin Castle in about 1870 when they were transferred to the new public record office, uh, record office in the Four Courts. O'Flaherty's index, running to more than 2,500 pages in the 10 oversized volumes, was available for public consultation in the record house of the public record office and thus survived the destruction. Now, the seven bundles of 1766 were, uh, returns were arranged as shown. 
loose alphabetical order was employed, so the Cashel and, and Emily and Armagh returns were bundled together in bundle 76. If a return was received which did not specify the diocese in which the parish was located, it was included in the Sundry's Parishes Bundle, Bundle 79. Now, as you'll know, Cashel and Emily is located primarily in County Dublin, with its western part lying in East County Limerick. In total, 27 returns were received from Cashel and Emily parishes in Union. 22 of these noted the diocese on them, and they were filed in Bundle 76. And the returns for five other parishes, the Tipperary parishes of Holy Cross, Kilcooley, and Killinall, and Knockany, and, Car and, and Knockany and Carconlish in Limerick, were filed in Bundle 79 because they didn't specify the diocese. Four dioceses are shown in bold red text. These are the dioceses from which some original returns have survived. For Waterford and Lismore, just one single return survives, and for Cork and Ross, only two. But for Armagh and for Cashel and Emily, the news is much better. Remarkably, Bundle 76 survived in its entirety. So all, 20, all of those 22 returns for Cashel and Emily in that bundle remain available to researchers today. And to get a sense of how rare these are and how unlikely this is, out of a parliamentary records collection consisting of more than 1,500 bundles, this is the only bundle to survive. So the historians of Cashel and Emily and Armagh won the lottery in terms of parliamentary record survival. The situation could have been even better, of course, if the ministers from the five Cashel and Emily, Emily parishes, which ended up on Bundle 79, had taken the time to simply jot down the name of the diocese on their return, those five parishes would also have ended up on Bundle 76 and would have survived. But I suppose we have to be thankful for what we have, but who could have imagined that a careless omission such as not jotting down the diocese name could have had regrettable consequences 126 years down the line. Now, we've seen that map already. It's the map of the coverage of 1766 as the returns were received. But here's a new map for you. This is a map showing the survival of 1766 material. Now, most of this information survives in extracts and transcripts taken by genealogists and historians before the record office was destroyed because the returns have been destroyed. So most of these returns here are all transcripts and extracts, not original returns. As you can see, a great deal of information has been lost. Little has survived in particular for the west of Ireland, the south uh, east Leinster area, and for Mead Diocese. County Kerry stands out in particular with not a single scrap of information surviving from there, the only county uh, with nothing surviving. But as we can see on the coverage map, the county was not well enumerated in the first place. It's also notable that for many parishes which had provided complete lists of names, right, so dark red areas over here, only the population numbers have survived. So they've moved from red to blue because in these instances, the early genealogists simply noted the numerical information from the returns and didn't take the time to transcribe the full list of names. So many areas have moved from red to blue. But the most important areas on this survivor's map are the parishes show, shown in gold, or yellow, and silver. Those are the original returns. Gold or yellow indicates original returns which provides the list of names, and silver represents original returns which were only returned population numbers. As you can see, most of the surviving original names are from Cashel and Emily diocese, which I show roughly by this red polygon. In fact, 19 original returns providing lists of names survived for Cashel and Emily parish compared with 14 for the other three dioceses with original returns, Armagh, Cork and Ross, and Waterford and Lismore. Without doubt, Cashel and Emily has the best surviving collection of 1766 original returns of all. So, let's have a quick look at the Cashel and Emily area in a little more detail. Well, that's a county map of Tipperary, and that's a, a map of the diocese of Cashel and Emily covering Tipperary and part of East Limerick, County Tipperary. So dark red is areas that returned lists of names, 
and these brownie type colors are these are also listed names but these are not within the diocese this is the diocese and these dark blue areas here are light blue areas our original returns providing our list of numbers or numbers only and these areas outside here like this is Killaloo diocese providing numbers only and if we just look if we just remove the non cashel and emily returns that's cashel and emily itself so that's what's that was that's the coverage that's what was returned and the areas with these asterisks are the bundle 79 items that didn't have the diocese on them. So that's the coverage for Cashel and Emily, and that's what survives for Cashel and Emily. That's what you have available to you, because the, se the bundle 79 items were destroyed. Now, so let's have a look at some returns to see what they, they look like. Okay, for Cashel and Emily, what survives? Well, there's a diocesan summary sheet when the returns arrived and were bundled up into the specific diocese, diocesan summary sheets were, were compiled within the House of Lords. The only surviving original diocesan summary sheet is for Cashel and Emily. There are also 19 returns providing the names of householders. So they're returns that complied with the House of Lords resolution. Tipperary has a double return because one provided the census information and the second one provided the names of priests. And three returns provide numbers only, and they are the Chancellorship of Cashel, Glen Keane Union, and Thurless Union. So a summary sheet produced by the House of Lords clerks for all dioceses except Armagh, presented numerical information by parish for all returns filed within the diocesan collections, and the Cashel and Emily summary sheet is unique, the only summary sheet to survive. And there's what one looks like. That is the only surviving summary sheet. That's just part of it. So it lists the names of the parishes. So in, this is for the Union of Latin, right? And that's a single return for the Union of Latin covering those eight parishes, six parishes, the county, which is Tipperary, the number of Protestant families, the number of Papist families or Catholic families. Some returns provided the number of Catholic people so the population as well as households, this one did. And the number of priests and the number of friars, right? So that's Latin Union. Second one is the Union of Thurlis. And this is the Thurlis information, which we saw earlier. This is it abstracted onto the diocesan sheet. Five priests, four friars. And the third one then is for Ballantemple Union. This was four parishes. And they try to provide as granular information as possible. So for Latin Union... The return didn't divide up the information by parish, so they could only provide union totals. But in Ballant Temple, they provided the information, the list of names by parish, so they provided the parish information. So it was as granular as possible. Turles Union, numerical return only. We've seen it before. It covered the union of Turles, eight parishes in the Turles area, and it was simply two bits of information, right, in terms of demographic information number of Popish families, and the number of uh, Protestant families. So that didn't meet the Lord's requirement. We're not very happy with that one. This is the worst return of all, right? It's for the Chancellorship of Cashel. It must be inaccurate. It's returned by Reverend Robert King, and that's his, that's his estimate. Protestant families, 10, and Popish families, 300. Okay, that's the poorest return of all from, from the Cashel and Emily returns. It's dated the 1st of May, 1766, so it's getting quite close to the deadline. And we always have to be suspicious about round numbers like this. So he didn't seem to have taken much time to compile that. That's the complete return. Not very happy with that one either. Ballon Temple Union, we saw that on the diocesan summary sheet. It was the third one down. A list of the families in the union of Ballon Temple in the Diocese of Cashel and Emily. And there you can see the parish of Ballon Temple. That's the first one. And that's the Protestants. And that's the list of names and then papists or Catholics, and the list of names. So that's providing, it's not providing any additional information beyond the list of names that was required. So we're kind of happy with that one because they're meeting the Lord's requirement. Abington Union, uh, I think it's in Limerick. So we're getting lists of names. These are uh, Protestants over here, a list of the Protestants in the Union of Abington, being Abington two and Clonkeen parishes. And then he lists the names of the Protestants. And then this is the Popish families or Catholic families listing the names of the Catholics. 
But look what he's done. That's all he was required to do, just give the names. But what he's done is, for the Protestant families, so Reverend Gilbert Rawson, he's giving the number of Protestants in the household and the number of Catholics in the household. So he's gone way beyond what the ministers required. Okay, this is really significant. And that could only be the result of, unless he's just guessing the numbers, you could only get that by calling from house to house to house to get these numbers. And for Catholics, he gives the number of people in the household. So that's a really, really good return. That's far, far in advance of what the, minister, or what the ministers were requested to do. So we're really happy with a return like that. That's very useful for the, for the genealogist, but it's also u very useful for the social or the demographic historian. That's a really impressive return. That provides you with information like mean household size in the middle, middle of the 18th century. Here's a super return for a facile union. Uh, there's your list of names. So that's what was required. So that's Protestants. And this is Catholics over here. But what he's done, he's gone even further than the previous one, Abington. He's providing Protestant males and Protestant females, Popish males, Popish females, and total. So what he's doing is he's not just giving the breakdown, the religious breakdown within the household, he's also giving the sex breakdown within the household. So this is a really, really detailed return. And for Catholics, uh, you are seeing, you're also getting here something that again wasn't re requested, you're getting occupations as well. Really, really useful uh, material for the social historian and far in advance of what the, the minister was requested to do. And also for Catholics as well, he's giving the sex breakdown within the household. So that's a really, really detailed return. It's one of the best ones around. Kilnarath Union. This is an interesting one here. Actually, this is a really interesting one. Okay, because he's giving the list of names as required. So that's ticking that box. But for the Protestant families, he, he's giving Protestants and Catholics in the household. But for the Popish families or the Catholic families, he's also giving Protestants and Catholics. Previous one didn't. It just gave numbers in the, in the Catholic household. You can see Protestant households contain Catholics and lots of them, right? This Protestant household, this would probably be the Protestant, one Protestant, four Catholics in that household, right? But lots of Prote uh, Catholics in Protestant households presumably as servants, but in the Catholics, you just get one Protestant. All the rest in Catholic households are, are Catholics. You don't typically get Protestants in Catholic households. But that's a really, really interesting one. And there are the, that's the total for the parish. In 115 Protestant families, there's 134 Catholics. So there's more Catholics, there's more than one Catholic Protestant household on average, whereas in the Catholic families, 850-odd, there's only one single Protestant, Matt Connor's house. So one Protestant in 800 or nearly 900 or 850 uh, Catholic families. Quite amazing to see the contrast between households. And again, really unique information that you will not get anywhere else other than in the 1766 religious census. So we're really, really pleased with that one. Not Graffin Parish. This is an interesting one because we can contrast this with the previous one, right? Again, you're getting far more than was requested. You're getting the list of names. Protestants, Catholics, but this time you're only getting the number in each family, right? So Andrew Rowe has seven in his household and John Edwards has five and so on. You're only getting the number though in each household. So this isn't as good as the previous one because as we've seen, many Protestant families contain Catholics. So you're losing that information. He's not providing that information. He's just giving the, the number in the household, but not the religious breakdown within the household. So you don't have as much information as in the previous one, but it's still a pretty good return. Look at that, that's the best return of all. This is New Chapel Parish. It's the best return that survives out of all the returns, all the original returns, plus all the abstracts, plus that whole map that shows the coverage, uh, the survivor map, 50% of the country covered, and this is the best return. It's coming from New Chapel Parish in South Tipperary. That's what he was requested to give, just that column, right? Just that list, that's all. Francis Stephen Thomas was asked to give and he went out and he determined or asked who had a wife and this is sons above 14 years of age, sons under 14 years of age, daughters above 14, daughters under 14, men servants, maid servants, men relations, friends or lodgers, women relations, friends or lodgers, number of Protestants total, number of pap papists or Catholics, number of souls. The total number, right? So that's a huge undertaking 
to examine a parish to that level and to compile uh, a list of names to this level. There was 101 households in the parish and he provides this extensive 14 columns of information containing an enormous amount of social information uh, for the historian. So that's the best return of all. And just to conclude quickly, this is Armagh, this is Cashel and Emily. These are the dioceses from which the most amount of original returns survive. The list of names is a requirement. 21 of Armagh's 32 uh, returns didn't provide a list of names. They just gave us numerical information. And 11 of them simply provided the list of names as required, right? So 11 of them just about hit the standard. In Cashel and Emily, only three of the 22 didn't provide a list of names. 13 of them provided the list of names, but six of them, five of them provided well above the standard, and one of them is absolutely exceptional. That's New Chapel, absolutely brilliant, right? So if we take those six returns, which give us really detailed religious information to the household level, and we look at them and we put those six returns and we examine them, this is the Protestant and Catholic experience contrasted. It's taking the 1766 religious populations, Catholic and Protestant, and taking the 1831 religious populations, Catholic and Protestant, because that's the next time that we have uh, detailed religious numbers to parish level. So it's taking that 65-year period, I think, that's quick maths, and it's contrasting for each of the six returns it's contrasting the Protestant experience with the Catholic experience. Blue is Protestant. So in Abington Union, the Protestant numbers declined in that 65 years. Uh, by the Protestant numbers fell, the Catholic numbers increased by 2% per year. And that's the, to that's the total for the parish. In each case, and look, in New Chapel, which was the one with a really good return, the Protestant number went down quite significantly while the Catholic numbers were increasing quite substantially. In all six cases, the Protestant numbers were declining or not increasing as fast as the Catholic numbers. So when you hear talk about the partition of Ireland and how Protestants were cleared out of Ireland and they were, they were driven out of Ireland around the, the 1920s or so on, the situation was happening well before that. It was right in the 18th century that Protestant numbers, Protestants were struggling in rural areas of Ireland. So I think that's a very interesting chart. And that can only be compiled or that can only be produced because the ministers in Cashel and Emily went well beyond the requirements of the House of Lords by taking the opportunity to undertake substantial social surveys of, of their parishes. And that's just the numbers there behind those. So in, for instance, New Chapel, there were 47 Protestants counted in 1766, and by 1831 it had declined to 30, and in Abington, 196, and it had declined to 165. So substantial changes, whereas the Catholic numbers were advancing quite rapidly from 3,100 to 11,500. So really contrasting differentials between the denominations in rural Ireland. And again, only uh, to be seen because the ministers provided us so, so much information. So the surviving returns, abstracts and extracts from the 1766 religious census are a remarkably rich source for the study of 18th century Ireland, particularly at the local level. And the historians of Tipperary are fortunate that original returns survive for a large part of the county. The surviving returns for this area are the best that are available for any part of the entire island. And the Virtual Record Treasury Project has made high quality images of all the surviving 1766 returns freely available for the local historians of Tipperary and beyond. That's all I'm going to say for you this evening. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. All of these images of the all of these images and all of these census returns are available they're available in the library up in the local studies area copies of them they're also available online through the virtual record treasury so thank you very much <laughs>